Thank you everybody for joining us today um, for the NANET's inaugural Women in Nets event. Myself, we can put the next slide, please. Myself, Nina Vijay Vergia. I'm one of the GI medical oncologists at Fox Cancer Center. And just like many of you, or most of you, share a common interest of research and clinical interest around neuroendocrine tumors. I am um, Chandrika uh, Chandrasekharan. I go by my first name, Chandrika. I'm a GI medical oncologist at University of Iowa with a common love for neuroendocrine tumors and Libras. So, um, so um, Nina and I have worked together to um, you know, come up with this program. Hopefully that we will have a good discussion after the keynote le uh, uh, lecture by Dr. Prince today. I'll let Nina go forward. Next slide. This is our planning committee. So thank you so much for helping us um, realize this idea. Next, next slide. So, you know, I just want to take a second to tell you, you know, how the idea came about. It was basically a candid conversation between myself and Dr. Chandrasekharan about an informal meetup for like, you know, friends and women friends, but under leadership of Dr. Bergsland and Dr. Coons at Nanitz, the diversity and membership committee, as well as the mentoring committee, decided to develop a more formal initiative to support women who deal with nets in various capacities, be it you know, clinical, research, pharma, any kind of. But if you're if you have if you're a woman or you want to support women who do neuroendocrine tumors, this is the place to be. You know, displayed here is our diversity statement, as you can see. The short-term goal of you know this event you know that we are hosting is to provide a forum for like-minded people to join forces, to develop professional relationships and collaborations, and also provide a safe space for us to turn for advice and you know, probably serve as a sounding board. We have a jam-packed session today for you, um, but first of all, some ground rules. Please uh, mute yourself in, unless you are talking. Also, the chat function is available and I and Chandrika will follow that and ask questions as um, they come along in the chat function. So please use it. Also use it to discuss amongst yourselves and um, also use the raise hand function, okay? Um, so we have everybody on mute, but obviously if you wanna unmute yourself, please do if you wanna ask a question, but I do appreciate if you all use the chat function a lot. Next slide. So with that, let's start the function and let's start our event today. I am so excited to introduce to you Dr. Pamela Coons, who really doesn't need any introduction, but um, I'll do it nonetheless. Now, she is the leader of the gastrointestinal cancer program at Yale Cancer Center and the director of the GI Medical Oncology Division there. She is an international um, for neuroendocrine tumors and through her research and clinical efforts, but on, based on her personal experiences, she has been motivated to research gender-related bias and equi equity-related issues in our field and has inspired me and many of us to work towards it. So let's wel welcome Dr. Coons. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay Vergia. I'm really honored to be here and kick off this wonderful initiative. So tonight I'll be talking about finding my voice and becoming an advocate for gender equity in medicine. These are my disclosures. I have a few disclaimers as well, just for start. Um, first of all, gender discrimination and harassment are really everywhere. I've experienced in a number of settings at a prior institution, but I think that this is something that we all certainly experience. Women of color face unique challenges and the problems are, can be worse for women of color, members of the LGBTQ plus community and other marginalized populations. I certainly bring um, a privilege to this conversation on um, being a white woman and I want to just- Why aren't you guys that. gone? And my path is not the only way. I think that there are a number of ways of approaching um, sort of this journey and I'll describe some of them and how I've made a pivot to incorporating gender equity research in what I do, but there are a number of ways of approaching that. And then lastly, this is the first time I'm giving this presentation. I am more comfortable giving a scientific presentation on NETS 
than I am on this particular topic. So I'm a little bit nervous. So I'll share with you all. When I shared this with my husband this morning, he said, this is your story and you're the only one who is an expert in it. So I think that was really reassuring. I'm gonna be vulnerable in hopes of empowering other women, finding solutions and enacting change. So this didn't really fit into an outline. So I have just a description of what I'm gonna talk about today. So this is my journey through experiencing gender discrimination, finding my voice and pivoting. The road has been windy and bumpy. And for someone, I like a straight path. So this journey has made me uncomfortable, taken me out of my comfort zone for, for sure, but I've really learned a lot in the process. So I'm going to start with the meme, how it started, and I'll reference this, how it's going um, throughout the presentation. So it started when I was 10. I found this picture in a scrapbook as I was helping my elderly mother move into a retirement home um, not too long ago. Both of my parents believed in me and made me believe that I could do and be anything. My father was a scientist and I loved science really from an early age. I attended Dartmouth for college and for medical school and arrived at Stanford in 2001 to begin my internship in internal medicine and stayed there for oncology fellowship. There I received amazing training and I really learned how to be a doctor. Um, I joined the faculty at Stanford in 2010 and as a junior faculty member, I felt supported, valued and respected. However, as I reached mid-career, I began to face some barriers. Around this time, um, I was encouraged to participate in a leadership course called Making Space. Um, Tending Your Nest and Making Space for What Matters Most was a course on wellness, mindfulness, and meaning making and leadership. This was sponsored by the Department of Medicine at Stanford and by the department chair, Dr. Robert Harrington, and his executive coach, Rebecca Merrill, who has since become a friend and my own executive coach. And it was through this course and some very difficult personal reflections and work that I came to fully understand that many of the barriers I was facing were related to gender. I was experiencing gender discrimination and harassment and I had really never thought about it in that way. Our first assignment as part of this course was a narrative writing piece. Now, I had never been someone that had kept a diary. I had not participated in narrative writing. So this was really new to me. Um, I approached the first assignment sort of like a sterile h and and it was really only after my, um, we had small groups in this leadership course, it was really only after my colleagues in my small group really were courageous and vulnerable that I was able to do the same. So I went back and revised my first narrative. I'll share with you just a quote from that. I was burned out and clinically depressed. Years of accumulated gender discrimination and harassment had taken its toll. I felt alone, demoralized and stripped of my self-confidence. So this course, as you can see, really allowed me the space, literally and figuratively, to really reflect on where I was. Um, on a lighter note, a second narrative assignment was to also talk about something that mattered to you. Um, I am wearing tonight the coat that I'm wearing in this picture. Um, and I wrote about the color of red and started off just with some, some words on what it meant to me. Power, strength, love, energy, life, confidence, and my dad's editing pen. So what does the color red mean to you? I wore this to one of my first big podium speeches at ASCO a few years ago. Um, and it, it was a really empowering event. So then I started thinking and reading more narrative pieces. Um, really one of my favorites is the series A Piece of My Mind in JAMA. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. There is a beautiful piece that really spoke to me called Systole and Diastole, Strength and Openness. I'm going to read an excerpt, but it really speaks about the value of a pause. So seize diastole, my medical school professor said, the words were a clever metaphor for a life well lived during systole, the powerful myocardium contracts, generating pressure that propels open the aortic valve, blood flows out into the circulation. Diastole, the process of letting go and filling up is not as exciting. It could even be taken for granted, cut shorter and shorter, but without adequate time for diastole, there's no blood to be thrust forward, homeostasis crumbles, 
Just as the myocardium needs time to release and refill, so does the soul. If we would put our stethoscopes to our own chests, we would hear the pause of diastole. We would remember that during that pause, there is work being done. A drop in pressure, relaxation, expansion, and then with a full heart, a gush of life. So I took a pause. I actually took a six month sabbatical and really dug deep and reflected on um, where I was in my career. And I did a lot of reading. Here's a pile of some of the books I read. I devoured books and articles on gender discrimination and harassment and women in leadership. I read about the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine report. And this came out around the time that I was um, taking this sabbatical. For those of you not familiar, their statement of task was to study the influence of sexual harassment in academia on the career advancement of women in the scientific, technical, and medical workforce. Nearly 50% of medical students experience sexual harassment, second only to the military. And to quote their statement, through our work, it became clear that sexual harassment is a serious issue for women at all levels in academic science, engineering, and medicine. The consequence of this is a significant and costly loss of talent. Um, I'll share with you a few summary slides. The figure on the right is this amazing iceberg image. Um, these slides will be available afterwards, but it really speaks to the fact that overt physical sexual harassment is really that top of the iceberg, but there are many things below the surface, including microaggressions, which is what I personally experienced and can be just as difficult. So the NASM summary stated that five factors create conditions under which sexual harassment is likely to occur in STEM. A perceived tolerance for sexual harassment, a male-dominated work setting, hierarchical power structure, symbolic compliance with Title IX and Title VII, and uninformed leadership. They also identified four aspects of STEM workplace that silence targets of harassment. One, dependence on advisors and mentors for career advancement. The system of meritocracy that does not account for the declines in productivity and morale as a result of sexual harassment. The macho culture in some fields and the informal communications network through which rumors and accusations spread. It was also around this time that Times Up Healthcare launched. It launched in March of 2010 with a mission to ensure that healthcare workplaces are safe, equitable, and dignified. At present, over 50 organizations have joined as signatories. These are healthcare organizations, hospitals, medical schools, and they are tasked with um, three commitments to state that sexual harassment and gender equity have no place in the healthcare workplace, that every employee should have an equitable opportunity, support and compensation, and that we will measure, track and track sexual harassment and gender inequity occurring at our institutions. So then I started reading the literature. I really dove deep. And um, there, I'm not gonna spend tonight on all of the objective data that um, show that there is gender disparity in medicine, but I'll just share with you a couple of titles. We know that there are disparities in leadership, in authorship, in academic rank, in salary, in speaker introductions, and with representation of women on the National Institutes of Health study sections. This article actually just came out this week. One article in particular um, I read and really felt seen. Um, this is entitled, Is Academic Medicine Making Mid-Career Women Physicians Invisible? With the first author, Dr. Lewis. She writes, mid-career women in academic medicine are at a continued risk of being made invisible. Mid-career is a critical time for all physicians and disparities for women need to be addressed in a scientific and expedient manner. It is especially important for the academic community to recognize that women in particular continue to lose ground at this juncture and are unable to be equitably represented at all levels of medicine, including top leadership positions. The phenomenon of mid-career invisibility maintains the status quo of gender equity in academic medicine. And by understanding the transition from training to early and to mid-career, leaders can focus on recognizing women's accomplishments and contributions to academic medicine. After this research, I really no longer felt alone, 
but I also had the realization that this was a problem much bigger than me. I couldn't unsee the disparities. They were everywhere I looked. The dude walls in this figure on the left, mantles, and I share some of these Nanit's pictures as an opportunity for us to be better. We've actually made some incredible changes and I'll speak to that at the end. Um, and symposia agendas, I obsessively would mark tally marks on how many women versus men were speaking at some of the symposia that I attended and participated in. So now I take you back to my sabbatical. I was still in the midst of my sabbatical doing some soul searching. I had paused, I was reading, and then I needed to really conduct an inventory on my values and what mattered most. Um, this was a book that brought me great meaning, The Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. And I um, uh, scanned in a picture that I had scribbled on and circled the, in the list of values. Um, my executive coach had me make a list of my likes, dislikes, values, needs, and asks. This is a list of the values that I wrote down at the time, respect, diversity, collaboration, equity, and family. And she reminded me that your values really never change and that you need to stay true to your values in your professional life in order to really have satisfaction. So after experiencing this gender discrimination, I was really a different person. I was in a different place and it was clear that I needed to make a change. So back to the meme. So then I became an unlikely, really unexpected spokesperson for the gender equity movement in medicine. Um, I, a quote that I said at a Title IX forum at Stanford got picked up in the local Stanford Daily. The San Francisco Bay Area Mercury News article picked up on the story as well. The cancer letter subsequently also picked up on the story. And it, um, you know, though I was an unlikely, um, initial spokesperson for this, I really decided that I needed to find my voice, speak up. In and of itself, it was empowering and I, and I hoped that I would help other women. So then I decided I needed to put my frustration into a positive direction and really pivot towards action and change. Um, I use these five words um, in an acronym REACH. So research, educate, advocate, connect, and heal is really how I approach this. I'll be honest, this sort of acronym really just came to me as I was putting together these slides, but I used these um, five areas and I'll speak to them briefly. So research, can you examine your field through the lens of gender equity? And I really challenge all of you to think of that. I participated in the Clayman Institute for Gender Research Faculty Fellowship um, while I was still at Stanford. I decided I'm a clinical trialist. How can I really contribute to the field? I am now um, conducting a study to examine the gender of PIs in phase two and three clinical trials in GI oncology. Um, I'm also helping to examine female representation on industry advisory boards and clinical trial steering committees and some other projects in the works. So what is the data on clinical trial PI ship and authorship? I'll highlight two articles on the left is a study by Ludmer et al. that really looked at first corresponding authors. As you can see in the, the red box, um, really there is a minority of female corresponding authors in the large majority of subspecialties. Gap for gastrointestinal female corresponding authors or clinical trials, it's only 7.9%. Um, very recently at ASCO GI this year, um, Dr. McNamara and colleagues presented on gender representation and authorship in later phase systemic clinical trials in biliary tract cancer. They found that um, overwhelmingly um, in figure A on the left, first authors and B on the right senior authors were men. Um, in the study that I'm currently conducting of the gender of PIs in phase two and three clinical trials in GI oncology, we are building on some of this prior research and are using a different database. Um, it is the clinicaltrials.gov database, but it has been structured into the aggregate analysis of clinicaltrials.gov or the ACT database where we have access to all of the structured data. We plan to examine the relationship between PI gender and other variables, including race, faculty rank, institution size, geographic location, and sponsor type. And we'll be conducting a survey that goes along with this. So in terms of educate, 
I um, really have loved digging into this field. Um, it has been inspiring and it has really made me feel not alone. I've read books and articles. I took that leadership course that I mentioned. I've taken it other women in medicine leadership courses. I was a faculty fellow for the Clayman Institute. I've participated in the Women in Medicine Summit, which I'll put in a plug for. Um, I watched the Picture of Scientist film, which I encourage you all to, um, to watch if you haven't. And I'm currently participating in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Building Gender Equity in the Academy course. So I was really on a mission to educate myself and others. And there are, this is just a small sampling of educational opportunities. There are many others. Advocate. So um, I joked to some friends that I, I feel that I went through a bit of a midlife crisis through all of this and needed some social impact in what I was doing. I think by definition as physicians and especially in the field of oncology, what we do has incredible meaning. I wanted what I was doing to have some broader impact. And so I really searched around for opportunities that I could get involved on a local and national level with gender yes. equity. So I'll remind everybody to please mute to your line if you are not muted. Thank you. Um, so from a local perspective, you know, encourage your local institution, your home institution to advocate for gender equity um, on a national, international level. Um, I've, you know, helped with the launch of the Membership and Diversity Committee at NANITS. Um, I'll also mention an ASCO initiative on the next slide, but I'm incredibly proud of the work that we did last year in the Membership and Diversity Committee and that that's being carried on by Dr. Camila Jimenez and Dr. Nina Vijay Vergia as the co-chairs this year. Um, I'd like to thank James Howe and Emily Bergsland for their support also. Last year, we accomplished an anti-racism statement a diversity statement. We are working on collecting and evaluating data on diversity and the Women in Nets event has been launched. Um, so at ASCO, I pitched a session um, that was supposed to happen last year, but it will happen this year yes, on yeah, dismantling yeah. gender yeah. disparities in the global oncology workforce together. Um, I encourage you to all attend this event this year. I'm so incredibly proud of the, the people we've pulled together for this. So I will be chairing Dr. Reshma Jagsi, who is a professor of Red Ankh, um, will be speaking on generating objective data around gender disparities. Dr. Hannah Valentine is a cardiologist at Stanford, and she was the most recent and inaugural NIH Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. She has since returned to Stanford. She'll be speaking on concrete steps to diversify leadership in medicine. And Leon McDougall is a family medicine doctor and he will speak about the role of male allies in intersectional feminism. And Ms. Deanna Smith is the CEO of the Sarah Cannon Cancer Institute, and we'll talk about the empowerment of female leaders. To connect, um, you know, you are not alone. And I think that this, this sense of connectedness, whether it be through social media, through the Hemant Wolfpack at GI ASCO and others, I encourage you to find ways to connect with other women with male allies, with an executive coach, with women in medicine groups. I think I've found this to be an incredible source of support. And heal. So this piece, it's still a work in progress, but this goes back to the nest part of that leadership course that I took. Um, nutrition, exercise, sleep, time management. I put my family um, in here because that really fills my bucket. Um, I have three sons, um, a dog. It's also a picture of my sweet mom. So what changes can you make tomorrow? So say no to manals. Um, really, I now ask, every time I get invited to a panel, I ask about the panel composition and I suggest other women. Suggest educational opportunities wow. to your leadership. I've been encouraging um, my division chief to participate in women in medicine courses or pay for women in our division. I encourage you to do the same. Bring picture of scientists to your institution if it hasn't been viewed there already. Include gender equity in your research. And if you are a leader, develop deliberate programming to reduce discrimination and disparities. And if you are a man, please be a he for she. And we can talk more about that later. This is just an example. I'm not gonna go through this. The Department of Genetics at Yale has a very deliberate parameter programming on how to support and retain women in, in their department. So just um, some concluding thoughts. Really determine what matters most and find your voice. 
normalize talking about gender equity. I actually have really just made that part of who I am now. Everybody knows that. And I think in that way, it just is really part of my day-to-day -day life. Be deliberate and clear with your voice. Incorporate gender, gender equity research in what you do. Educate yourself and others. Advocate for yourself and other women. Connect with others and heal and take time for wellness. So I'll finish up with the how it started and how it's going. So I am now at Yale. I am the director for the Center for GI Cancers, chief of GI Medical Oncology, co-leader of the NET program. And I'm, I'm really proud of this journey that I've taken. I've learned a lot about myself um, and um, really hope to be an advocate for other women. So RBG, <laughs> one of my favorites. So women belong in all places where decisions are being made. And um, I'd really like to acknowledge this whole list of, of people here represented by these groups. I'd like to really thank Nanets for the opportunity to kick off the Women in Nets initiative. Um, so thank you. I will pause there. I think, um, Nina, I will let you navigate questions if we have time for a few. Um, thank you so much. First of all, you know, I just, um, I'm so grateful to you for giving us this talk. And, you know, I think I have been inspired. I just want to start working on stuff tonight for it. So I pre thank you very much, Dr. Coons. Really appreciate it. So I will we wait for a few questions to roll in through the chat. If anyone, I see Dr. Chandrasekharan has a hands up or, oh, it was just a, it's a high five. Okay. Sorry. I just clapped. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm learning too. But so um, if, if you guys have questions, please put it in the chat box. Or um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask Dr. Coons, that's absolutely fine too. It's very informal. But one question that, you know, always comes to my mind is, um, you know, let's say, you had an experience at, you know, at one institution and, or you were, you're worried about an, you know, an experience somewhere and, and you want to read about, um, you know, when you are applying for a new job or a new position or a new place or a new institution, what are the signs to look for, for yourself to say that this is a place that as a woman in medicine or a woman in nets, I will thrive. Is there like some subtle signs that you, we should look for? That's a great question. Um, I did a lot of homework. Um, I think it's really hard. I think as many of us can appreciate to really get a sense of the culture of a place in a few visits. Um, I, I read about Yale on the internet and I said, said before, you know, no place is um, spared kind of issues around unconscious bias and discrimination, but I went in with eyes wide open. I talked with people outside of my division. I talked with friends of friends. And, um, you know, I think for me, I, I needed to be in new soil um, to borrow a sort of an analogy that a friend of mine made. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy so far. So this is Mona Pam. Uh, it really takes a lot of courage to share your story and be vulnerable. So thank you so much for doing that. There are uh, very good lessons learned for most of us uh, as women in the scientific arena. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mona, I appreciate that. I echo, echo Mona completely. So I, um, Chandrika has a question and I see um, Dr. Berklins also has a question. So I'll let Chandrika um, tackle I'll, I'll kind of read the chat in case anybody's not listening, uh, reading that uh, Dr. Berklins also thanks Dr. Kins. Th th thank you Dr. Kins for like sharing such a very deep personal story um, uh, you know, in front of an audience, I'm sure it, it takes a lot of courage. Kind of a follow up to that, you know, one of the the worry about you know speaking up is of course retaliation and the fear, you know, to build up this courage. Um, if you could share with us how you navigated that initially, you know, especially at a you know big institution as you're going through this, and you know, any words of wisdom from that perspective? Um, I mean, I get one yeah when you see something happening in front of you that you want to speak of? Yeah, I think that's a, a really great question. One that um, I um, you know, should have addressed perhaps in going through the course of the slides, but happy to address now. You know, I felt that I had a unique opportunity to speak up because I had a job in hand. And I don't think I stated that explicitly. Um, I had already accepted a position at Yale when some of these articles were starting to come out and I made a conscious decision to speak up. Um, I still, each time something comes out, even tonight, 
I get these little like pangs of fear, um, especially after I had a couple months off between leaving Stanford and going to Yale. And I had these fears that Yale would rescind my offer. They did not. <laughs> um, but I, I feared retaliation. And I think that there were some unpleasant comments on articles, um, I'll be honest, that in some of those that came out. But for the most part, I had really incredible support and was lifted really by the community of women. Um, I was a fairly, fairly new to social media at the time. And I, there are pros and cons of social media for sure, but I have to say for the most part, that really was a community that lifted me. And I found like-minded people who really wanted to advocate for me and for other women, and that was helpful. Um, for folks that, I, I, the fear of retaliation is real. I don't want to minimize that. I think that um, I have, since spoken to many women across the country, trainees and faculty, as a result of my speaking up, and I've heard stories of retaliation. And I think those probably have to be tailored really individually to the person and to the institution. And um, you know, happy to speak more to that later. Thank you so much. And for everyone, you know, if you are in a situation, you know, use use us, use this community as a sounding board. Okay, that, that is the, you know, the, the main goal of today is to inspire us. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuntz, for doing that. And then also to create relationships. And that's the whole point of the breakout room that we are moving into next. So um, we are, we are at, the hour, at the time that we are going to move into our breakout rooms. But before that, thank you so much, Dr. Kuntz. Sincerely appreciate it. And if you guys have more questions, Dr. Kuntz is going to be in one of the breakout rooms too. But um, and for now, we're going to move into the breakout rooms and we will all um, you know, get a chance to know each other in a more uh, personal level. We can see each other's faces and talk a little bit about each of the uh, topics that we have in there. So thank you. Um, can we please move to the next slide? Awesome. So we have three breakout rooms. And very soon, we will all be placed into the right breakout rooms. It apparently happens magically. Um, so yeah, so let's do it. I want to call out on the moder new moderators of each of the breakout rooms to just give us pearls or like some important things that we discussed. Um, so welcome back, everybody. So here, um, I, from room one, I would invite Dr. Ayer to talk about um, what um, what we learned actually in that breakout room. I don't know if uh, Dr. Ryer is muted or unmuted. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Uh, we were fortunate to have uh, Rebecca who is an executive coach as well as Pam in our group. So I think the three takeaways we had were one is, you know, you have to know your own worth um, and, and to advocate for yourself, knowing that and sometimes looking up data to know what the median salary is for your rank at your institution or in the region you work before you can go and ask uh, for whatever it is that you believe you deserve uh, is, is, is one pearl we took away, um, knowing your worth and asking for it because people don't, as, don't assume they know and don't expect someone to actually come and give it to you or hand it to you. Um, um, another pearl that, uh, that came up was, um, you know, to... Um, to know that um, that you're not an imposter, you're, you you deserve it, and, and and if for some reason you think that uh, am I wrong? Am I wrong to ask? Am I feeling slighted? Um, more often than not, um, that's not the case. If you if you believe you belong there, you do, and uh, it seems like more often we um, we know we belong, but there are people or circumstances, the context that makes you somehow feel that you didn't get what you deserved. Um, so just um, sort of um, uh, recalibrating and knowing that. And I think uh, one of the other things we wanted to talk about a little bit uh, uh, more uh, was uh, building allies and, and male colleagues or others um, that can also speak for you. But we didn't get a chance to talk about that too much. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, so next I would like to invite um, the oh, invite Dr. Odorosio or Chandrika from the room number two. Yes, Dr. Odo. Well, I was just going to type and I realized 20 minutes just flew away because I just want everybody to introduce themselves and, you know, and just 
accepted most of the time. So we, Dr. Odorizio shared her story about, uh, um, Sue, I don't know if you want to speak up for yourself, but I think the one thing we could really discuss was asking for help and relating the struggle that somebody else has and acknowledging it. Um, and Sue made a point that so many years ago, she had to go through this and this is 2020 and she still hears the same story from Dr. Kunz, you know, in the, in the keynote presentation. So I guess it's a reminder that not things have changed, but still a long way to go from years ago to now. It's still um, considered a man-made world, not a, you know, human-made world. <laughs> yeah, um, and like asking for help and realizing that there's, you know, personal responsibilities outside of work is also a work in itself. I think that's really all we got to, honestly. So. Yeah. Thank you. I think acknowledging it and, you know, make us, making us all feel that we're all going through the same thing actually is very empowering in some way. And third uh, from the collaborators and allies group is Chris or Alex. Can you help us? Sure. Um, so uh, we spoke about a few things. And again, the time was too short. Uh, we all agreed that we all miss seeing each other in person. <laughs> um, we talked about the difference between uh, role models, mentors, collaborators, and allies, that none of, the, none of these are necessarily synonymous, but they certainly can be. Uh, and to be cognizant of the fact that all of these can come in different shapes and sizes, uh, and we should feel comfortable to reaching out to those who don't necessarily look like us, um, and especially within the NETS community that everyone feels fairly comfortable and is just an email or phone call away and willing to work with one another. Um, and then we briefly touched upon upcoming opportunities um, for matched mentorship within NANETS. Uh, so if, uh, if individuals are interested, then that is something that should be launching soon um, with the hard work of, of people, some of the people on this call. That was it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, next slide, please. So this is the you know, mentoring program that uh, Alex was just talking about. You know, this is, um, it's, it's under, under auspices leadership of Dr. Odorosio and as well as Dr. Clark. Um, this is an opportunity of linking mentors with mentees. So please register. Um, apparently the link will be in the chat pretty soon if it's not already there. But all, and we can also, we will also mail it out to everyone. Next slide, next slide. All right, so just, you know, we're about to be closing very quickly. I just wanna let everyone know, this was just an inaugural event. We just, uh, you know, testing the waters out there and it was an amazing session by Dr. Coons and I really sincerely appreciate her taking the time to talk to us. And to everyone else who's on the call, you know, you, um, I think you are making the program successful. Our goal is that we do this at least twice a year, one around the main meeting and once in the winter, but also we wanna keep the conversations going. So anybody you click with, anybody you wanna to talk to during over the call, just reach out to us, one of us, or to them directly. Everyone is more than happy to speak and probably has been going through the same thing or is going through the same thing. We're also, putting out a survey because we are trying to open up like a social media platform for all of us to just chat about things. And um, please take that survey and, and suggest which of the different, because we are all social media outed by now because so much of it we've done. But I think these are, this is the value of social media. Like when we are not seeing each other, we can still see each other. So, and then I wanna to talk to you about the Nanet's uh, monthly webinars that have started. We just kickstarted the events. So every third Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m., we have events. Um, the next one is going to showcase all the research work that has been supported by the Nanet's, Nanet's uh, grants. So it will be a very exciting one. will be very inspiring as well. So please join us. Next slide. So yeah, that's um, pretty much it. And so this is my contact information and Chandrika's. We are happy to you know, get emails from you and connect you with anybody you want to speak with in the network. Um, but... Um, please reach out and uh, please join our community and, and keep your support us for us. So, and yeah, please join them. It's, it's a fun organization. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And please, uh, we'll really value your feedback and on, you know, ideas to make this better and more beneficial for the participants in the future. So please uh, go ahead and fill the survey at the end. Thank you. We have one minute. Anyone has uh, any oh. uh, closing comments? Dr. Bergsland, Dr. Strasberg, I see both of you on. And I just quickly just mentioned that we need mentors and mentees to sign up for the mentor match. So 
Everyone's eligible, please. I just want to thank Nina and Chandrika for, for your efforts around this. And I want to thank um, Pam Coons again for sharing her story, which was just really fabulous and really appreciate everyone being here tonight. And send us suggestions. If any of you on the call have suggestions of other things you feel are missing or lacking or would be really high value to you. And we'll definitely take it back to the committees and, and go to work. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. We are going to adjourn now. Thanks. Thanks so much.